Thanks again to Carbon Health for being our presenting sponsor. If you are a regular here, you know I've talked about Carbon Health and how long I've talked about Carbon Health and why I love Carbon Health. They help with things like COVID, cold, flu testing, antibiotic prescriptions for things like infections, UTIs, STDs. They have primary care services in California and Massachusetts. But if you're new here, Thank you, by the way, for stopping by. You should also know that they can help with injuries as well. Most of their locations have imaging or x-ray machines so they can diagnose strains, sprains, and fractures if you unfortunately become injured. And I know, unfortunately, not everyone will be near one of the 120-plus locations, but they do have virtual urgent care services for states like California, New York, Florida, and several others. So thank you to Carbon Health. Really, really happy to be working with them. Check out the link in the description. Happy Friday, everybody. No capes and cows today, but we are very excited to be bringing you an interview that we had with Catherine McNamara. You might know her from Shadowhunters or Arrow. Um, she has a new movie coming out with Charlie Day, Fool's Paradise. And at the time we shot this interview, she was working on, um, on the show Walker Independence, which unfortunately yesterday we got the news that it was not renewed. So when you see the question come up about me asking, is it going to get renewed? Don't think I was being insensitive. It was just shot earlier. But nonetheless, Catherine McNamara was just a delight to talk to. So we'll have um, we'll be doing that and airing that in a little bit. But I also wanted to take some questions from you guys. Because we usually do this on Sith Council. Like we we uh, during the on the community page on YouTube, we asked some questions and you guys have usually put some great questions for the Wednesday Sith Council edition of Big Thing. But I've never really done it for the the main show. So I was like, all right, you know, why, why don't we try to do that? And you guys can ask whatever you want. There's some great questions. So we'll get to that and more. Uh, before we do, who's going to be in New York? Who's going to be close to New York? Who lives in Philadelphia? Who lives in Boston? Get to New York, man, on June 23rd. Everybody always says, hey, man, if you get to the East Coast, then I will definitely be there. Well, if you live on the East Coast and you haven't bought your tickets, then I'm going to have to say you're uh, you're full of crap. So June 23rd, you can watch the show. Myself, Winston, Coy, Kate, Brett. Looks like I might be able to get one more person working on it, but it looks like it. And then the next night in Stanford, Connecticut, Double Toasted, Mark Ellis, myself. I mean, that's when you got to definitely see for sure. Four of us doing a podcast together. I mean, that's going to be a blast live. So make sure you check it out. And you get tickets at thechristianharloff.com. Um, okay. So with that, make sure you also, you want to get yourself a, whether it's a big thing shirt, Sith Council, any of that, you go to our T Public link, which is linked in the bottom there, Spotify. Check us out on video. And uh, let's do it, everybody. Don't forget the interview we did yesterday with Freddie Prince Jr. Also on the, the channel at the moment. But here we go. Here's the big thing. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's do it. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, Fast and the Furious, or Fast X, coming out, I guess. It would be a week from today when it comes out. I'm kind of bummed. I, miss, I have to miss the screening, but I will be seeing it when it comes out. I just watched Fast 9. Not great. But I watched it on at home over the course of like three days, which was easy to do. And it was mindless entertainment, but it's it, it, it when you watch the, the fifth one, I really enjoyed a lot. I think from four on, four, five, six, really good. Seven starts to get silly. Eight's silly, silly, and nine is just off the wall. Like not, it, it just loses a bit of its magic. And I hope ten kind of gets it back. Momoa looks like he's having a lot of fun. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm, the cast is, is pretty pumped. And I always enjoy watching those movies. I, I It's like, I don't know if it's guilty pleasure at this point, but I just dig it. And I think that a, a, a lot of people feel that way. And that's why they make a billion dollars every time they put in the theater. Fast 9 doesn't count. It was during the pandemic. So I don't really fault, you know, the, the it, it did the least amount, but for the time, whatever. I've been watching some random shit, guys. Random stuff. A lot of 80s stuff. And a lot of you guys might know that because on... The website, thechristianharloff.com, I started a new podcast that's just for the people over there, but it's a podcast I kind of always wanted to do, and it really, it's just what I'm watching is what it's called, and I kind of explore 
whatever was kind of in my mind to watch at the moment. Like some of the stuff I'm going to be covering this month on the podcast is this is just what I've watched thus far. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Fast 9, The Last Unicorn, uh, Mystic Pizza, uh, and Richard Dreyfuss's Let It Ride, which nobody knows what that movie is except me because I loved it so much. But those are some of the things, and it's, it's not even the end of May yet. It's going to be a lot. So if you want to get that podcast, that's exclusive for website members. So make sure you check it out, the thechristianharloff.com, as well as the rewatches. The rewatch this month is going to actually be Fast 9 which will be a rewatch for some, but for me, it's a first-time watch. Um, Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get to the Catherine McNamara interview in just a little bit. I want to get to some of these questions. I know that you had a bunch, and we'll talk about the questions, and then we'll go to the interview, and that'll be probably a shorter episode today. It is what it is. Maybe not. I don't know. But here's here's the first question that came in, and this is from James Diesel, 1468, who says, Hey, man. He didn't say, hey, man. I made that up. He said, what happened to the live streams? Well, and he probably saw yesterday. He he wrote that question before last night. The live streams, for those who don't know, I don't know. You know, I'm very curious. I'm going to ask people who are watching this right now to comment when I ask this question, as if we're doing a live stream right now. How many of you knew that I do live streams on the Christian Harloff and Friends channel? How many were even aware that there is a second channel? Because I don't promote it that much. I, I, it's not it, The channel is not meant to be this big promotion. I hope it grows and hope this whole big thing happens with it. It really is just kind of like this exclusive club for people who are subscribed to it and that want to be part of the live streams when I do them. I usually do them when I do them at like 4 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m. PST. And it's just a matter of how my work day is going. And if I have some time to do it, I pop on there. And if you've ever seen the movie with Christian Slater, pump up the volume, It's I've kind of taken that mentality of it. It's like, okay, I'm in the mood to do it. I can do it. I have the time to do it. Camera's on, microphone's on, let's go. And if you're around and you see the notification, that's when it's not, it's not like this scheduled thing. It's people, I've gotten people who said, well, yeah, but if you do it that way, you're really not going to get a lot of views from it. You're not going to get, it's not going to grow the channel. It's not the intention of it. The intention is really just, Who's around? Who wants to talk? Who wants to have some fun? And we and we do some things. We have some conversation, and we mess around. Uh, and to answer your question, I did one yesterday. I was really slammed the last couple of weeks, which is a good thing. I just did every time. I kept getting close to doing one, and like a phone call would happen, or I had to do an email, or I was editing something, and I was like, I just don't have the time to do it. But yesterday, I had the time to do it. I'm going to try to do one by the time this recording is taking place and we'll see my goal is that i had done two this week that's my goal maybe i just did one you guys will tell me because this is this is um this is coming i'm shooting this in the past and you guys are watching this in the future so um but yeah the live streams are they're not going anywhere i'm going to be doing them i am going to be doing as many as i can when i can so if you're subscribed to that channel you'll see more of them just make sure you hit the notifications on and i know some people youtube kind of stinks that way anyway People who say, I never get notified even when I do have the notifications on. So it's a it's an algorithm thing. The best I can tell you is if you want to catch those live streams, check around the 3.34 p.m. PST area um, weekdays. I do some on the weekends sometimes when I find time. You know when I usually do it is I when, when my daughter, my youngest daughter is watching television in the mornings, I usually sneak out in the back and, and do about an hour, an hour and a half when I can do it. But that probably won't happen this weekend. But I enjoy doing them. I have fun doing them, and I enjoy the conversation. So, yeah, it's the Christian Olaf and Friends channel. Thanks for the question. No, they're not going. In, they're not anywhere. They're uh, they're they're still around. But thank you, James. Okay, next question here from Ray Espinoza seven five six eight. He says, "Is the war with the squirrel still raging?" Also, what are the worst movies that you've seen? Uh, the worst movies you've seen is a is a tough one. If you meant this year. I haven't really seen too many big stinkers this year, to be honest with you. Um, I haven't seen any movies that have really been like, ugh, it was terrible. I didn't love Cocaine Bear like everybody else. I don't think it was terrible. I thought it knew what it wanted to Well, I don't know if it knew what it wanted to be. I, thought it was, I, th- I think that was my biggest problem with that. I think the tone was kind of all over the place. But people loved the tone. So I was on the I was on the opposite with that one for a lot of people. Um, anything, I haven't really 
think there's really bad movies this year that I've seen. It's not to say that there haven't been any. I mean, ones that I just thought were okay. Ones I thought or that I was excited for that I thought were going to be good. And like, like Ant Man was fine. People hated it. It was fine. Um, I liked Mario. Really loved Guardians. John Wick was incredible. Loved Air. Um, yeah, The Evil Dead was really good. So I don't know yet. I mean, in general, I mean, I, I mean, of all time, I really have to comb through it and, and think. There's tons of stinkers out there, but nothing that really stands out this year that stinks. So as far as the world with the squirrels, the war, war the war with the squirrels, excuse me. No, uh, that that doesn't happen anymore because I'm telling you, my old place, the squirrels at that old place were rabid assholes. They were dicks. They were dicks. These squirrels aren't bad. They don't bother anybody. They play, they, they play in their trees. Sometimes they jump around. The dog chases them, but they don't bother me. It's I never had a beef with squirrels. I had beef with those squirrels. Those squirrels were dicks. The ones in my old place, they were dicks. They used to come into my place. They would run around. They would terrorize my kids when I walked. They'd be like staring at them, looking like they were going to jump. I hated those squirrels. These squirrels aren't. These are not bad squirrels. These are, I don't mind. I. Until you mention him, I didn't even, I didn't even, I don't even see him. I see the dog chase him sometimes, but that's it. He can't chase shit. By the time he he starts running, and they're halfway to Detroit. So no war with the squirrels anymore. It's officially over. But I know I might bump people out, but it's, that's that's what it is. Next question here. Oh, James Diesel again. Best concert, first concert. Best concert to me is a tie. Between Bruce Springsteen in Anaheim, 2010, I think. Maybe 2009, but around that area. 2010, I think it was, in Anaheim. And Guns N' Roses at Dodger Stadium. When was that? I think that was 20, was that 2016? I think so. Uh, that one that one was great because I didn't, I didn't know what to expect from Guns N' Roses that many years later, and I had taken and I took my wife to see them, and we had a blast, man. That was that was a really good concert, and the and the Bruce Springsteen one was amazing. Those are the two that really stand out. The first one I ever went to was Brian Adams and Def Leppard together. My dad took me when I was really little. Um, so yeah, Ma was it Madison Square Garden? I think it was Madison Square Garden. Those are the ones that I always remember. Thank you for that question. All right, next question here. This is from Lil Guzzi 8426 Hey, Christian, I intended both in-person movie club event at Flappers. My question is, what movie potentially could be our third meeting, Spider-Verse or the Marvels? I would probably venture and say uh, The Flash if it was going to happen, but I don't know if it's going to happen um, because John and Greg are busy. I'm not sure. Plus the fact that I really want to concentrate on the on this one. You said you saw the movie clubs. My question to you is, did you watch the big thing? Because the big thing is going to be available. I think that the the one the movie club one is still available to watch with me, John, and Greg on live stream until this Sunday. This bad boy that we did, that's going to be in, available indefinitely if you are on the website. And if you go to the website, thechristianharloff.com, you can watch the event that we did. And that was full stand-up for the first hour. And then the following 50 minutes after that was full podcast with myself and the first it was me and Mike and Steph for like 15 20 minutes and then it was me and Winston and Coy for another 15 20 and then it was we we ended with Roxy, Brett and Kate which was chaotic as you would probably imagine and that was the, that was the show and I thought it was amazing. I thought it was to me it was a um I I, re I really have fun with with John and Greg and we we have a good time talking but I I like the element of comedy. You know, you guys know me. I've, I've just been doing this thing. Like I always liked, to, and the whole reason I wanted to do this channel because I can infuse. And the reason why I was so distant on the Collider stuff because it when it when it's too. And, I, and again, this is not specific to the movie club because I had a lot of fun on both those shows that, that I did with those guys, and we had some laughs for sure. But. I don't know. I like. I just kind of like having the the whole crew, and as we're building out the big thing and and doing those live events there, I think that I'm going to concentrate on that. But it's not to say. I mean, if John and Greg want to do another one, I'm a, I'm open for it for sure. But I think that right now, like I said, New York, uh, Connecticut, 
I want to do a show in front of an East Coast crowd. I think that's going to be a blast. And that's going to be available for streaming as well. And for people who are on those tiers, I think it's like over the if you're at the ten dollar tier on the website, you get every live event. So you would get both of those. If you stream them, I think there's a separate price for each one. But if you're on the ten dollar tier, you get them both for like ten bucks. So just um, if you're able to join on up, I hope you can. Um, what was the other question that you had there? Oh yeah, but I think that what we're going to do for New York, for example. Coy and Winston and myself will definitely be talking about The Flash because that'll be the week after Flash comes out. So we'll be talking about The Flash. So if you want to be able, if you want to check that out. Now, did you say that you were actually, you attended both in person? Were you a little goozy? Were you at the, uh, were you at the big thing one as well? And if not, I want you to go check it out on the website and then you're going to say you wish you were because that was a rowdy show. Really rowdy show. I had fun. We had fun. But we are going to be doing after parties also. If you guys didn't know what the after parties were, and we're probably and we're ninety five percent sure going to do one this month. And what the after parties are, we're going to have everybody from the big thing in studio and do like a massive. It's almost going to be like the old Schmoes No Show um, SEN Live, where everybody is going to be in studio. You're going to have mix and matches on the, at the at the live show. You had. Basically, the pockets of people that you want to see that you've watched here, whether it's Sith Council, you get to see me, Mike, and Steph live. You get to see me, Coy, and 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 Winston live. You get to see me and Brett and Kate and Roxy. Um, but at the after party show, you get to see mix matches of combinations that you never really see, right? So you would see Brett and Winston and Coy, Mike and Winston, um, Mike and Coy, Mike and 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 Roxy, uh, Steph and Roxy. We see them a lot on World Goes, but you know what I mean, on this channel. So that's kind of the idea after party with some drinks and some fun, and that's exclusive as well to the to the website. So just be be aware of that. There's another thing that's included. There's tons of stuff included in there. Um, but as far as that, if you want to check out that in-person live show and see what you're missing, go check it out. All right, next question. Here it is. Tom Hanks, what up, man? Five four five eight five. Do you listen to Force Center podcasts at all? And would you consider having them on for an episode? Um, I mean, look, Ken and I have been friends for a very long time. I'll be completely honest. No, I don't listen to Force Center. It has nothing to do with with those guys. I think they're great at what they do. Um, I don't listen to Star Wars podcasts, to be completely honest with you. And again, it has nothing to do with the amount, with all the people who do them. But that's one of the reasons why. There's so many people who do. And my philosophies on talking about Star Wars are very different than a lot of people. Um, I would. I don't really necessarily want to tune into shows that, that I don't want to tune into shows that hate everything. I don't want to necessarily turn into shows that love everything. I like to have debates on my show with the things that we like, the things that we don't like, and that's why I like to talk about them more so than listen to them. And, and I mentioned this on the stream, I think yesterday, on the live stream. Um, I feel like right now with the like i'm a yankee fan right it's like just be and this is what i never understood if you're a star wars fan you're like star wars dead were you ever really a fan i'm done i'm done i don't want to be part of this anymore were you a fan you can be a yankee fan and go team's just not that great right now you know it's just not great i mean the yankees are pretty great right now but you know what i'm saying like i remember i always look at like the 90s the the early 90s, late 80s. Not people are like, 90s? They won the title in 96, dick. I know. I'm talking about the really early 90s, late 80s. They were not good. Management wasn't the best. And it's that's kind of what I feel right now. And everybody has that if you're if you're a sports fan. You know, it's like, okay, this is the team I loved. They're just not great right now. They have great, they have really good players. They just don't have they don't have the game plan right now. And they they keep trying, but they they might make the playoffs if they're lucky, but they ain't winning any titles. Um, and when they do, I'll be there. When they come in last place, I'll be there. I'm not a fair weather fan. I'm rooting for them, but as a fan, I want to be able to say, I didn't like that game. I didn't think that lineup was good that game. Would have liked them to do that. Didn't happen. Would have been great if they won that game. Doesn't mean, dude, screw that. I'm not going to watch that game. I'm not going to watch that team anymore. Look that team. <laughs> and it's like, that I don't understand. Um, 
But I also don't want to do, oh, the team's amazing. I don't know. I don't know that, that they are. Um, this has nothing to do with the question that you asked, because the question is, um, as far as Joseph and Ken go, I think those guys are incredible. I think they're both hilarious. Joseph is is an incredible talent. I was so impressed with him when he did like the Schmodowns and his knowledge about how funny he is. I like Joseph a lot. I think Joseph is a, is a stand-up guy. Um, and I like Jen. I know Jen Murrow's on that show as well, too, sometimes, I think. I, I know she's really busy writing, too. Jen's always been very kind and sweet every time I see her. So I, I love the I love the crew. Um, I just, like I said, I don't, and, and if you, you, same thing would, Ken probably have the same comments, too. If you asked him if you listen to Sith, he doesn't listen to Sith. He, he and I have very different philosophies on Star Wars. We know that. We don't even talk about Star Wars together because I don't really agree with a lot of his points on it. He doesn't agree with a lot of mine. Um, but we can talk about it. We can talk about it casually, but it's not what we talk about when we see each other. We talk about comedy. We goof around. We laugh. We've been friends for 20 some odd years. So we, we, we talk about other things other than Star Wars, to be honest with you. Um, so having Ken on, on as a guest on Big Thing and having Joseph on a guest uh, on as for Big Thing, 100%. I'd love to have them both on uh, and Jen as well. But I wouldn't want to talk Star Wars with those guys, to be honest. Um, but anything else, I, I'd love to have them on. I think they're great people. Uh, okay, next one. Here it is. Film Goo Zero Zero. Hey, Christian, what's the main goal with the future of your YouTube channel? Um, I mean, look, right now it's building. It's it's building out, and, and the live events are, are an experiment right now. That's why I haven't announced anything past New York. Because we're at, right now we're at like... I think 70, almost 77,000 subscribers on the channel. We did that in a little over a year and a half, which was very impressed. So people are like, oh, the channel says it's been up since 2019. Well, it was a clips channel. We talk, we started, this channel started as a SEN clips channel and then eventually turned into the Schmodown clips channel and then was like an SEN live channel where we ran the SEN live for a little bit and they didn't really know what to do with it. And then I started writing, running a couple shows on it and they didn't, you know, they didn't do what we kind of hoped that they would. And in, I think, August of 2021, I started running a few episodes of Big Thing on it to see how it would do. And it was, I think, September, October of 2021, where I said, well, let me start doing some reactions and reviews, dipping my toe back in the water. And I started doing that. And I started dipping my toe back in the water. And people were watching them. And I was starting to see some traction on it. I was like, well, let me, I'm having fun doing this because I... I think I lied to myself and told myself that it wasn't fun anymore in general. And that wasn't the case. It was the way that I was doing it in the past that wasn't fun. It was it was being mandated and dictated to to do it a certain way or having to do it or this is the time to do it. I was like, let me make my own rules of when I want to do it, how I can do it, and see if that works. And it did. And I, you know, I I experimented with stuff. I experimented with the um remember I remember learning quick that the algorithm is not the same today as it was when Mark Ellis and I were doing stuff for for schmoes. And what I mean by that is we would do it, let's say we would watch an, an older movie, and granted the, the subscriber base and was, was different, but like if we were like, okay, I'm going to watch a movie that I hadn't seen before and it's been out for like a couple of months, it would do pretty well. So I was like, oh, I'll do that again with, with Free Guy. People are going to maybe probably – want to know what I think about it. Nobody gave a shit what I thought about that movie. And I, that was the first review I did out the out the gate. It was like free guy. And it was like nobody watched it. I was like, oh, maybe people don't care about reviews anymore. It's like, well, it's not that. It's not that. They don't care about it four months later from you, dickhead. They care about if they're going to see the movie when it comes out. You see it early, great. You see the day of, do it. And then I started doing those out of the theater reactions and other things. And it started to to play. And I was like, okay, this this is working. And I've given credit to him many times over and I'll do it again. Greg Alba and I were on the phone many times over and he's been so, his nose just in it um, for so long, giving me tips, helping me out, helping me build like, you know, little tips and stuff that I would, that I would do and, and, and all this. And I just, and I was really kind of one man banding it for a lot. And I was running the channel when I was at Skybound and anything that, whether it was any monetization that the channel did, during that period from 2021 until last year in September, all anything that the channel made, whether it was podcast revenue or or anything, super chats, it all went to Skybound. It was that was that was part of that was part of the deal. Like I just because that channel was the movie 
Schmodown, the movie trivia Schmodown Clips channel, which was theirs. And I built out the um, I built out the channel, and they were incredible. When I left, I was able to get the channel and take the channel with me, and and do my own thing. And and now this is this is my gig. So the answer to your question is to, con- to continue to grow, but I also want to produce more things. I'm working on something that I'm producing right now. I can't announce it yet, but it's looking good. And I think you guys will be excited about it when I can officially announce it. Just got to push things through. You got to get people to continue to watch, comment, like, do that. Let people know that we're doing these shows. Get more of an interest on it when, when you're watching it. Make it part of your rotation, whether you're going to the gym, if you're taking a road trip, if you're enjoying what we're doing here. Support it. Listen to it. You know, check it out and let me know exactly what you think. All right, let's uh, let's do a couple more. Then I want to th- want to throw this uh, this interview. Um, I, where is it? Are we do, are we done? I don't think we're done yet. Oh, sorry, I got so much. So as far as what my main goal with is, it's to it's it really is to continue to grow it out, get to a place where uh, the goal is if we can get to a hundred thousand subscribers. And then start to see because I what I don't want to do is when we st- when we started I always take an indication of of um, the live events right when the Schmodown was at its height and we did an event in New York we sold out in like two or three days Chicago we sold out quick a thousand seats now I'm very aware that the Schmodown is a, a different type of property and show that people want to see but when I put a show on and L A is different also but when I put a show on and and we need to sell a hundred and 40 tickets or whatever it is to make sure that it's worth doing. And it takes to the day of, we did it, but it took to the day of to do it. It's like, it's, it's still a feat and had people and Kate Mulligan was like, you gotta be so proud, right? It's like, maybe it's the freaking perfectionist in me. I don't know. But I was like, no, I gotta, I have to, we gotta sell those out faster because it, it shows that there's a want for it. So right now, New York is selling, Connecticut is selling, but it's like the same thing. It's like that slow thing until we can start selling out shows quick again that you guys want. And it's it that's the other thing that I always tell myself, right? It's I anybody who always gets upset with anybody else in the in your life with when you're not in the place that you want to be and you're like, "Well, how come that person has this? How come that person has that? I should be doing that." Don't do that. Because it's always on you. It always is on you. Well, I don't get it. No, it's always on you. You can, it's, I'm not telling you that it's easy and some people don't have it easier and there's not paths sometimes that come in easier, but there's always a way. There's always someone who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that can help, but we don't always do the work. And I certainly say that like um, when it comes to like stand up, I was doing. I was doing seven shows a week, two shows a night. I was doing showcases. I was getting great opportunities, and I gave it up because I said, all right, YouTube is is a new thing that it's working for me. I'm performing. I told, I kept telling myself, I'm performing all of the time in front of so many people, and we built a great audience, Alice and I. And and I still, like, I'm like, shit, had I stayed, and I, I realized it, like, had I stayed doing both, probably had a very different stand-up career because I'm doing, when I go back up on, on stage, I've been doing really well. The sets have been well. The sets have been good, and I still I feel like I still I still got juice, you know, and I still got I still got ammo in the tank. But I look around a lot of the people that I came up with, and they're all crushing in stand up. And I was and I can't go. Oh man, what, what I the choices I made, the choices I made. So in and there's a lot of things that I look at and I go, yeah, but if I had done that, then I wouldn't have this, and I wouldn't have that. So like, there's always positives inside of it. I'm just saying. It's and and this is advice that I that I had gotten from from, um, from Ari Shafir years ago, and I remember being like thinking about particular things, like oh, why does that guy have this? And then he's like, what do you give a shit about that guy for? Concentrate on you, what you're doing. You're right. So there's always advice that that he'd give me that I always I always stick to now because it's just it, it it's always on you in a, in a certain aspect. It's always on you. Um, right, you know what I'm gonna do? Let's throw to this interview. And I want you to see Catherine McNamara because um, it's a great interview, and she's awesome. I never met her before, didn't know about her. She's just really cool, humble, 
And I got to, I was sitting in and I was watching her. She, Perry was in here and interviewing first, and I was just listening to her. And you can just tell, I like going second when we do these kind of um, tag team interviews because I can get a gauge of who the person is and how I feel, how comfortable I'm going to be myself and how comfortable I can make them or how much I have to work to make them comfortable, how much I don't have to work to make them comfortable because they just are pretty damn cool. And she was pretty damn cool just listening to her. So this is going to be a breeze. So we talked about a lot of great things, man. So I hope you enjoy it. I want to get your comments on it. Make sure you do that. That helps that, that algorithm we're talking about. Make sure you throw that out there. Before we move on, I wanted to talk about Mint Mobile, man. I really love what Ryan Reynolds is doing at Mint Mobile and what he did at Mint Mobile. And now, um, obviously, been in the news for a while now, and it's getting it's getting out there. More people are aware of it. And we've been aware of it for a, a bit. But we're so excited to have them on as a sponsor, and we hope that you switch over. We really do. So here's, uh, here's a few words about Mint Mobile, and we hope that you check it out. And then right into the Catherine McNamara interview. Here you go. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if you learned anything, what you learned is that there's always a catch. I heard about Mint Mobile a long time ago. And right away, they go, okay, we got premium wireless, and it's only starting at uh, 15 bucks a month. I say, yeah, right. What's the catch on that one? But then you talk to them, and I'm using their service. And guess what? It all makes sense. There's no catch. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they are the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you, and it works like a charm. Set up a separate line with them, and they just it's just clear. It's easy. And if you hate your phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless, just 15 bucks a month. All plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivery on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile. Get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. So if you want to get that wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and you get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash thing. Mintmobile.com slash thing. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash thing. Well, thank you, me. I just threw it to me, so I'm throwing me again. So as I told you up top, I'm very excited because... Once I told you guys, I know how many Arrow fans we have. I know how many Shadow Shadowhunters fans we have. Well, I got Catherine McNamara on the show, and she has a new movie, Fool's Paradise. She also has Walker Independence, and I want to talk to her about all of those things and more. And here she is. Hello, Catherine. Here how are I you? am. You Thank are you here. so much for having me. Of course. You know, the first thing I have to bring up, because I don't know if you noticed inside the studio, a lot of Star Wars stuff here. I love it. I feel right at home. I saw your post. Big celebration on May the 4th. Yeah. Um, are you a Star Wars, like, casual fan, mega fan? What what, what kind of uh, Star Wars fan would you say? I was raised on Star Wars. Oh. I have loved Star Wars from the time I was probably six or seven when I first saw it. And the uh, the original trilogy yeah. is my favorite. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's just such an interesting world. And it's all-encompassing. And the mythology is so great, but it still has a sense of humor and... and you know, legendary cast and crew, and um, it's it's a world that always feels like home. There's so much nostalgia to it, but I think now, me think, talking more of the filmmaking side, yeah. I, I have such respect for the practical effects that were used, yeah. and I think the sort of resurgence and return to that now is really interesting, so, you know. Yeah, there's so much going on with it right now, yeah. and your world, I mean, it's it's hearing your story is one of the things, too, because I I've, people know that Perry also shoots um, interviews here, and, and I was able to kind of listen to what you guys were talking about, and I learned so much about you just from the half an hour that Perry was talking to you, where it is really nice to hear humble and grounded people, and it's really the way that you came off inside of that, that brief conversation that I heard with Perry. Thank you. Yeah, and from what I hear inside of the theaters where you kind of started yeah. and then television has been the thing, mm -hmm. right? For the most part. Yeah, and keeping in that Star Wars thing, Star Wars is television right now. Now yeah. they're going to get back to TV, but with stuff like The Acolyte and, you know, they, Andor. Uh, Andor. I love that you brought that up. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, Ahsoka coming up. Yes. And the reason I bring that up is because 
the second you made that post, there were people that started to blog right away and say, where would Catherine McNamara fit in the Star Wars world? <laughs> and people started throwing out Mara Jade from the Legends, uh, Luke Skywalker's girlfriend oh, at the time. Right. So great. You know, I, exactly. So I don't know if they're going to do that or not, but is, if they're, I know the obvious answer is if Star Wars comes knocking, you Sign open the door right away. Uh, yeah. what, how much do I have to pay you to get me on Star Wars? No, uh, I'll give my left foot to be a, a Star But make me a stormtrooper. I don't care. <laughs> like, I just want to be a part of that world. Have you had meetings to ever, at all for Star Wars? No, never. No, never met with Lucasfilm. Never. we got to get you in a Lucasfilm. I would love that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to go back to Kansas City. Yeah. And I want to... Th there was something else... Come we, on down. We'll get you some barbecue. I would love that. Yeah. And the re a couple things as I was reading about you... And my daughter, I have an 11 year old daughter and she's moving into middle school now. And she had some, you know, issues as she was transitioning in third, fourth grade, you know, she's, and I love her for this. I love that she's like me, a kind of a, a geek and, and plays the cello and does all these, I, and she's super smart. She's such a cool kid. She's a super cool kid, but she's going through things where she didn't feel like she was the cool kid and feel like she was bullied and all those things. And I know that you had a very strong presence in, as you started to make your career to be very um, involved in anti-bullying and, mm -hmm. and all that is because you, when you were younger, which was shocking to me, to be honest, that you were, you were bullied pretty heavily yeah. growing up. It was that a Kansas city thing. Was that because you were a theater kid? Can do you, Want to talk about that at all? Or? Uh, I mean, I can touch on it lately. Like, I think, I think you know, unfortunately in this world when, when people are different than whatever the norm is, that yeah. can happen. And um, that's one reason I was so outspoken about it is because it's the simplest thing is to just be nice to people. Yeah. You have to really go out of your way to be mean to someone and to bully someone. And, and I just think that, you know, I don't know why that still persists or exists in our culture, but if there's anything I can do to counteract that, I will. Yeah. And to, you know, show people that, hey, you can just be nice. <laughs> right. Uh, just just right. be kind. It's smiling takes fewer muscles than frowning, you know? It's 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 the simplest thing. And I, I mean ov obviously we know that it often comes from something that has nothing to do with the person right. who's being bullied and so then, you know, having conversations about supporting each other in other ways and being there and finding the people that are going to be supportive of you instead of tear you down. It it leads into much bigger conversations, yeah. but you know, I I was really grateful to have some good close friends and family that that did support me right. through and kind of helped me navigate that as a kid. Well, that's the important thing. I mean, because not, not everybody has that, right? right? And not everybody, some people feel so alone because they don't have any support whatsoever, whether it's friends, mm -hmm. family. And that's ultimately what I told my daughter. I said, you can always come and talk to us. Yeah. You have your friends that you have. But it's being able to do that to start because that can take confidence away from you mm -hmm. in any situation, especially yeah. as a child, right? Yeah. So finding the confidence again to do what you do, <laughs> right? I mean, you have to. And it's, yeah. is that so does the theater, does acting, does that become ultimately like a therapy kind of uh, get away from it all place? Oh, goodness, we're getting deep. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, look, <laughs> unfortunately, acting does kind of become therapy sometimes, bringing up all of your, you know, deepest, darkest things that have been painful in your life to, <laughs> you know, access different emotional things. Yeah. Um, no, it's not really. But it, it, it I like to joke. That yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's it is a lot of it for me when I first started. It's getting to go be someone else for a little while and wear a mask and tell a story and, right. and kind of explore a different world, both both in a, in a sense of creativity and fun and also in a sense of it is it can stories can be a relief from from life. That's sure. what they are. They're an escape, yeah. especially so many of the stories that I've been able to tell. And that that honestly is something that I love so much about having done a show like Shadowhunters, because it is such an inclusive show and it spans so many different things and has become relatable for so many different people. Um, are the shadow, we call them the shadow fam because it's the, the shadow hunters fandom is the most beautiful thing. And I call them angels because they absolutely are. It's become this incredible community of support and acceptance and love. And so much of, of that is because that's what the show is about. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what you're made of, no matter whether angel, demon, or human blood runs through your veins, it's your choices that right. make you a hero. And, and it's your choices that, that determine who you are. And you can build your own family, as most of the characters on the show do. And getting to watch people connect and relate to the show and to the characters in yeah. that way has been, and find friends and find community in the fandom has been the most beautiful experience. It's, and it's so interesting to hear you say that, too, because 
there are a lot of fandoms, even speaking about Star Wars, right? Star yeah. Wars, Marvel, DC, those fandoms are tough, man. And I look at like sports fans. They're, I'm not saying that there's not a lot of great positive fans because there certainly are. Oh, but yeah. with the way that social media is and the way in general, and you have a significant following on social media from the shows that you do. Mm -hmm. And do you, and, and, it's, and it's actually very encouraging to me to hear you talk about the fandom that way, how supportive it is, because I don't think every fandom can say that. What, what makes the Shadow Hunters so different, do you think? I think it all started with um, I think it started with the story, a yeah. lot of it, because ultimately that's what the story is. is about love. It's about love is more powerful than anything in this world, any force, angelic, demonic, or otherwise. Right. And, you know, the, the found family concept runs so strong through the show as well that I think a lot of people start con by connecting to that, and mm -hmm. then we'll find which character or characters or relationship they connect with. But it ultimately it's down to the people within the fandom. And this is why I travel all over the world still and do conventions for shadow hunters. Yeah. Every, every, I just came today. I landed from Germany. I was oh, at a comic con. Wow. I literally landed two hours ago wow. at LAX. But it's because these, the, I call them kids. They're yeah. not kids. Many of them are lovely. Let's hear that you're adults. kids. You're, yeah, but I call them sure. kids. But so many of these kids just have created this, this community and they are there for each other and they support each other. And there's, you know, fan artists that now have careers yeah. because of the fandom. There's people that have met their spouses, people that have met their best friends that they never otherwise would have and right. have found confidence and support and and love. Even, even it was my favorite thing when the show would be airing and people would disagree or be unhappy with something in the story. The, the conversations people would have were never these kind of vicious fights. It's crazy, it yeah. was It was a very... Um, structured intellectual debate of, oh, I see how you're saying that. I differ in opinion because of these reasons, but I respect that this is your opinion because oh. of these reasons. And it was just so nice. I know it's sad that that's so foreign to me, <laughs> you know, because when you see these, uh, like just the way that t like Twitter, I'm, I'm yeah. a big advocate as much as I love it for social media, like the promoting. Yeah. I'm a big advocate that I want it to go away. Uh, yeah. I just feel like it, it's just, it, it, we've lost we've lost this I know the conversation you know I know and I see both sides of it too because I've met so many kids that have reconnected or connected with people that are their right. soulmates in right. so many ways that they would have never met if it wasn't for Twitter interesting so you know it's, it's it goes both ways it does you're not wrong but no. it's just it's just I just see so many things happen there that I'm just like yeah if it goes away there'll be another app yeah. um, I think I think the important thing we have to remember is that you know Yes, it's it's important and it's a connective tissue and it can be good or bad, but ultimately it's just ones and zeros. Yeah. At the end of the day, You're it right. doesn't. It has no substance, truly. Right. And if we can respect it for what it is and love it for what it is without letting it take over our lives, that's the sweet spot. Well, it's also kind of the tone of everything we've been talking about right now, mm -hmm. and that's the choices you make in deciding what you want to say, right? Yep. And it's a matter of like the same thing we talked about when I was asking you about the bullying stuff is that people choose to be mean. People choose to be mean on Twitter, and you can also choose to lift people up. You can yeah. choose to put out a a helpful and fun um, meme or something yeah. as opposed to one that's going to make someone sad. So yeah. it's like there are choices, and you also to go back to what you were saying, you don't know what's going on in someone's life when they're doing these things. But mm -hmm. you had a very positive um, experience, and I love that with Shadowhunters, with the community in general. Was it the same with Arrow, or did you see a little bit more of the other side of what we were talking about? I was actually very lucky okay. um, when it came to that. And I, I was a bit trepidatious going in because, well, when I auditioned, I didn't know this, but when I found out that I was playing the daughter of Oliver Queen and right. Felicity Smoke, right. um, that, that Elicity relationship is so beloved to the fandom and they're so protective over it. I I just wanted I, I just wanted them to like me. Yeah, right, <laughs> I wanted right. to do I wanted to do a good job, and I wanted to honor all the work that Stephen and Emily had done for so many years. And I, I was very fortunate. The writers had such an amazing um, idea for for Mia and for her story coming in. And then you know as it went on, I, it kind of developed, and we would had so many conversations about yeah. it. And and it was really beautiful the way it all played out. Um, but you know, I, I was very grateful that the fandom welcomed me with open arms and was really willing to just jump right in and yeah. go. There was a little bit when I first came in of like, well, who is this girl and why is she here and what's she doing? And then right. when the penny dropped of who I actually was, they were like, oh my god! <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And you and you were able to do. I mean, Flash, you were able to do yeah. it on. So you're able to play that character and take different aspects of her and and different shows inside the same network, obviously. But like, what do you feel because you've done? You now you want to know that I just found it recently. You want to direct, which yeah. is awesome. How did I find that out? <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I the fact that you want to direct. Did you always want to direct? Is that something that came about uh, 
for being on Shadow Hunters mm -hmm. a lot and kind of seeing the process. Is it television? Is it film? Where does the passion kind of come from, and where does it? Where do you ultimately want to land with it? I mean, I knew I always wanted to explore it, yeah. um, but I didn't think it would come for a couple of decades, probably. Yeah. But then I was working with um, Michael Goy. He came to do an episode of Shadowhunters. Who he's brilliant cinematographer, director who's been around forever. Uh, he came to do an episode and. He'd come in and gone, great, you guys have how you shoot your show, and that's nice. We're going to get weird with it, yeah. and we're going to do things differently and have fun and be artistic. And he was really open to me, you know, asking questions and doing it. So I was having a lot of conversations with him. And one day he turned to me and he goes, you know you're asking all the questions a director would ask, not the questions an actor would ask, yeah. right? And I had no idea. And since then I've sort of looked at it a bit more, and as I've shadowed different directors mm -hmm. on Arrow and the like, and, and really studied directing, read Sidney Lumet's book, which changed my life, um, I, I, I do have a very directorial sensibility in the way I look at telling stories. Yeah. And I think it comes from starting in theater, and starting in Kansas City theater specifically, where you're working as a team to tell a good story, not to further what your specific you know advantage might be. I get hopeful in theater, um, but people who start in the theater want to direct because I'm always, I, mean, I guess, call me story snob and character snob. I like this. I mean, sure, I like to shove popcorn in my face and watch the big yeah. explosions and all that stuff like anybody else. Like I said, I'm a big Star Wars person, but I like, even with Star Wars, I was a little bit more critical on some of the episodes recently because I want to see a more deep, like you mentioned Andor. Andor was perfect. Yeah. Andor was perfect. What a deep dive into character and story. And yeah, right. So, so good. that is why I get hopeful when I hear that, like, people who've been in theater so long, it's, do you obviously you take that with you mm -hmm. when you like, what what do you think if you had an ideal tomorrow someone said okay you can direct anything you want no matter what it is yeah tv movies what do you direct uh i think whatever it is i, I would want to tell a story that i could apply a lot of perspective to yeah and whatever that is but a perspective that tells a story because that's what i love most about directing is that as an actor, you know, you have your, your lane in which you can tell the story. You have the things that your character goes through, what right. your character looks like, how your character interacts with the other people in the world through which you can tell the story. But as a director, you can tell a story with light and with yeah, color and right. music. And where you put the camera is literally directing the perspective of the audience. And I think finding ways to have that be meaningful and mm -hmm. have that say something uh, and everything be so intentional and purposeful is exciting. Yeah. It, I think it absolutely is. And to see what you're going to do with it will be amazing. And speaking of someone who's directing for the first time, and that's Charlie Day. What, tell me the story about how this all comes about. You were, so you have, you have the movie coming out May 12th. Yes, May 12th, Fool's Paradise in theaters. Charlie Day's brilliance, writing, directing, starring in the film. He's chef's kiss. Yeah, I mean, and if, who doesn't love Charlie Day? I mean, right? he's, he's, I mean, come on. He's hilarious. Every interview, everything you, everything I heard about him, um, so I used to do a show years ago with Catherine Reitman, oh, and fun. she's the coolest, and Catherine was, was friends with Charlie, and I remember he was, like, on her show at one point, and she just would rave about how great Charlie was, and you just see more things, and, like, the evolution of him directing, you go, yeah, of course, yeah, because you just feel like if he wants to do it, those sets are going to be fun. Yeah. And he's going to put, I think similar to what I was just saying, like he's going to really put an emphasis on the character and the timing and the beats. Is that, mm -hmm. is that accurate? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, so much of what Charlie does is about comedy and the sensibility of comedic timing and things like this. But what I found in working with Charlie is that he's so conscious of the, the magic that happens on set and yeah. sort of the play that can come from it and the allowing of of ideas to build on ideas and and making sure that everyone feels heard yeah. which is such a rare thing on set and such a beautiful thing but what what excited me and gave me so much confidence and you know I don't get to do comedy often I love comedy I don't get to do it very often and getting to come in and, and play in a film that has some of the greats of not only Hitters, entertainment Sudeikis, but, but yeah, comedy yeah. in the world Ken Jeong yeah. everyone else and uh coming in for a day I'm going can I am I gonna am I gonna be okay or am I gonna ruin this movie um but he gave me so much confidence by being excited by ideas I was bringing to the table and then giving me notes that built upon those and then his ideas gave me ideas which gave the other person in the scene ideas which kind of really created this beautiful microcosm it seems like a lot of freedom too so much yeah. but but he also had clear direction with his freedom, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. He knew the story he was telling, he was decisive about what he was doing, he had his perspective, right. and yet 
still allowed everyone to play. And that's the brilliant balance. Yes, and you kind of have to be with comedy, too. because if it, I th I'm, Look, there are definitely directors that have an idea, in, even inside a comedy, to say, no, we got to hit those beats, do it that way. Yeah. But the comedies that you really, the ones that I loved kind of growing up and, and just in general are the ones where you always hear, yeah, we got to play. That wasn't part of the yeah. script that particular moment because they knew the character well enough. They knew the director's vision. They took the shot and being funny and they're talented. Right. And they made the move and it made it happen. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing about directing. And it's, it's very similar with, you know, how I approach acting. You know your stuff. Yeah. You make sure you're prepared. You know everything backwards and forwards. But you're not locked into it. You still have to have a sense of an opening for that magic to happen and that that sort of freedom of the moment and that collaboration. That's right. And I think, and then so speaking of collaboration, I know that you were also in, in New Mexico for yeah. Walker Independence. And you yeah. said there's a big collaboration there Absolutely. with everybody too. So tell me a little bit about working on that and, and how you, you know, I know season two, potentially, fingers crossed. We're, we're, hoping. we're hoping. We're hoping. I mean, hoping. television is such a strange landscape at the moment. So we really, we truly know nothing. So right. many people are like, I know you can't tell us anything, but no, we truly know nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, we just launched on HBO Max, yep. so you can actually see it now and you can stream it whenever you want. So please visit us there, relive the story with us or watch it for the first time. Uh, it, it was such a magical story. We, you know, we wanted to walk the Walker Texas Ranger legacy is such a huge one to yeah. try and step into and for them to do an origin story, but led by a woman and have a woman be the first walker in Texas and yeah. kind of tell the story through that perspective. It opens a door with what we ultimately wanted to do with the show, which was take perspectives in, in a Western that you maybe haven't seen yet and that haven't really been given the credence that they deserve. Yeah. You know, people that were there, people that are sometimes there in Westerns, but usually tangentially, or they're very pigeonholed by the stories that have been told by them or about them or involving them over the years. And getting to bring in you know, this cast of a world that feels familiar and characters that feel familiar, and yet as you peel back the layers, you find out there's so much more there, not only to this town, but to each of the people within it. Yeah, um, and just hearing you, uh, obviously, just tell I, I never envy you guys with what you have to go through. Even people like you're you're working all the time, yeah. and for people who in this business who are looking for that next audition and looking to get the gig, and now right now you know obviously with the writer strike and everything happening, it's like it is it's tough. Yeah. So I don't admire the uh, the I mean I admire the hustle. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I just I the it's that it's that feeling of like okay i have this show it could get picked up we don't know now if it's not going to get picked up because we don't know what they're what they're seeing if they're liking it or now we don't know because we want to make sure that our writers are taking care exactly. of exactly right? yeah right. yeah that's the important thing but i mean the one thing that you're always certain of being in entertainment is uncertainty right every job is going to end eventually Right. And, uh, you know, unless you're on Grey's Anatomy, which is still going, <laughs> is, you know. That's crazy. <laughs> that shows like you that. we're going to be way in the ground by the time that show is over. I I'm love Grey's you. Anatomy. Yeah, it's crazy. I do. Yeah. I love it. It's, you know, my family's in science and medicine. So yeah. I put that on and it feels like home, yeah. especially now that Harry's on the show. And I, I'm, I really enjoy it. But, um, but no, it's, it's one of those things that you just roll with the punches. And you yeah. know that, especially now, I think there's such an interesting opportunity because there's so many ways of getting things made that are unorthodox, yeah. that even if you're not working, you can go make your own stuff or at least develop right. your own stuff. Yep. You know, if you have the, the ability and the freedom with which to do that, um, I think that's even more exciting. Because if you think about it, the, the, the films and television shows that changed the landscape of the industry were never the ones that people had confidence in. You're they right. were never the ones that people thought were going to succeed. They were things like Star Wars and Top Gun. That, yeah. you know, and even people, in comedy, look at Seinfeld. Exactly. Yeah, right. That people said, yeah, sure, you can try and make this thing. And if it doesn't work, that's your career. <laughs> and it right. made not only someone's right. career, but a whole industry shifted. Well, it loops back into it, this whole thing, the whole thread of... Believing in yourself, and believing in you know taking that shot, making your choices, yeah. and you have made some amazing choices, obviously. And we got two great projects that people can check out on HBO Max, obviously, and then on May twelfth, Fool's Paradise. So thank I wanted so to thank you for coming in here for sure. We you you're traveling from Germany and everything else. <laughs> Take a break, rest for a second. I'll try. I'll Please, try. thank you once again, guys. Catherine McNamara, you can find her all over the socials, um, and make sure you check out both of the project. So thank you once again. Thank you. Now back to me, me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So first of all, thank you very much to Mint Mobile. She saw in the beginning of the, um, the beginning of that segment there. And how great was Kathy McNamara? She was great, man. She was really, really awesome. I'm glad that we had her in studio. It was a bummer about the, I know just sucks now seeing 
the Walker part of it because news came out the other day that it was canceled, which sucks. But it, such is life. And she said as much, too. You hope, but you don't know. And she doesn't think she's going to be hurting for a gig. She's going to be working for a while. She's very, um, very sought after, if you will. Um, all right, I mean, you know, I'm going to finish up some of these questions, by the way, that came in, and then we'll call it a day. Russell Mador, 3144. Do you think Jonathan Majors will be recast? The trial takes time, and the court of public opinion still the biggest obstacle. Well, look, this is the thing. I do think he's going to be recast, um, but I think they're waiting, obviously. The writer's strike is something that they're working on. Uh, the question is how many more people come out? What are the facts? I think one of the biggest obstacles is this. The thing that is that I want to know is what what do the publicist, his publicist, old publicist and old, what's his management company that dropped him, what do they know that we don't? Because it just doesn't make sense to me that if you've been working with this client for so long and he's at the height of his powers acting wise, and is it just pressure from everybody? Like, no, this is bad. We got to drop him. That certainly has happened before, but it's also odd that nobody else would just pick him up considering Marvel hasn't dropped him yet. And yet no one has picked him up. And maybe they have. Maybe you guys can tell me. Maybe some, maybe another firm, another management company has picked them up, and I'm and I'm wrong. I'm I'm not paying enough attention to it. But it just it just seems to me like what facts do they know that we don't that they would just because if I'm running a business with you, and John of the Majors is our biggest client, and the facts aren't there yet, we don't know them. We, from what we know, we know some. We know accusations are there in this too, but we don't have all the facts to the case. And we we go no no no. He's he's gonna pull the business side of this he's gonna pull through this he's got all this marvel stuff and we're gonna make a lot of money together so we'll figure it out unless you hear like no marvel's gonna drop them we have this there's a lot of evidence coming out right now there's more i hear this 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 and this maybe we drop them and we should or we're getting all this pressure all this pressure's coming in it's not worth the stress on the company it's not worth trying to 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 fight this fight, let's drop them. Any one of those scenarios is is possible. It's just what do they know that we don't? But Marvel seem, Marvel's waiting, and now with the writer strike and everything too, there's a little bit more time because you've got Loki season two is coming out. He's going to be in that. Um, the other movies that he's going to be in don't shoot for quite a while, so they have time to wait before they make any decisions. So I shouldn't definitively say he's going to be recast because. I don't know. I don't know what's coming out as far as other accusations. I don't know. I don't know what case his team now maybe has to say no. This was these were false accusations, and we can prove that. And this is there's going to be both sides of it. So I shouldn't definitively say that he's going to be recast. It just looks if it was today, and you said Marvel needs to make a decision today. I would say yeah, they're probably recast. But who knows what's going to happen over the course of the next year? I don't know. Um, all right. Getting back to the next one, Stephen Somers, 4628. How long do you expect this writer's strike to last? So funny. I had some, I don't say ball bag, but some guy on Twitter the other day going, hey, you're going to talk about the writer's strike? You're going to talk about the writer's strike? And I was like, yeah, you know, we've been talking about the writer's strike. It's like people should fight for what they uh, what they believe in. And the studios are taking advantage. They always have, and they've been waiting for this to happen. And the writers should be fighting for what they're what what they're fighting for. I stand with the writers. Um, and we've talked about it before too. And he's like, you're gonna you're gonna keep promoting studio stuff. I'm like, no, I'm gonna talk about the shit that I watch. And he's like, I said we, but we have we uh, we have stuff that we've actually promoted inside of I think the Kristen Miller interview. And he's like, no, you said the impending writer strike. And he, LOL. What do you, do you what do you what do you think? And I go, what I think is I don't talk to people who still use LOL. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, right, you hack. And I was like, that's the end of this conversation. I can't. It's just not the way to, ha like, it, it, again, presenting to, you know, a guy with, like, he just created his account yesterday just to fuck with people and, 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 and cause some shit, as opposed to just saying to someone, hey, do you have, what are your current thoughts on it? Because I just haven't heard it as much, too. Instead of being, like, looking for an aggressive fight, because that's what people do on Twitter, obviously. That's why I hate that fucking app so much. But instead of doing that, because I would love to see an actual debate with somebody. 
and you say like, hey, man, listen, I'm curious. Like I haven't – I watch your show or I tuned into that particular thing and I've been watching and I haven't seen you talk about the writer strike and of what are your thoughts on it. I think that's fair. That's a, that's more than fair. And, my, and as I just told you, my thoughts are that they should be fighting for what they fight, what they what they worth. And I think that I've seen it for many times over that the, the streaming thing, by the way, is just not well defined at all. And people are getting taken advantage of. I mean, shit. Look at the thing that happened with Scarlett Johansson with the streaming, and just imagine and that was Scarlett Johansson. Imagine what they're doing to the writers in general. It's not it's not definitive enough. They don't they don't have a, a good. Um, there's, there's not enough that's carved out for writers, and it's become harder for them. So they should be able to fight for what they're worth. But um, I think that it's going to last till at least July or August because I think that the studios wanted this to happen because they can now cut certain projects that they were spending a lot of money on. There's other things that they can cut that they – this this was – they they learned from 2000 and Eight, and they knew it was coming. They knew that hey, once the the contracts are up at this point, you know they're going to strike. Yeah, we can push it to this to this amount. That's why they push certain projects back, and they have stuff in the can, and there's things that are coming out. So they're not. Unfortunately, the writers are going to be the ones that are really are and because they they need to fight and they need to get they're doing, but but from not working, they're going to be the ones that are that are going to be hurting more so than the studio if it lasts until. July or August, because like I said, the studio has prepared for this. Um, but I think it pushes into July and August, if I was to guess, which is a long time in general. I, I hope it doesn't go into the end of the year, but I would say July, August, right around. Because the other side of it is um, the question is what's going to happen at Comic Con, right? You, you'd assume there's going to be a lot of picket lines out there. I, mean, I One would assume. Um, all right, next one. 11th Cub fan. Any plans to do reaction videos, either TV or movies? So I've done a couple. I, do, I did some for House of the Dragon. You know, I did some for a few other ones. We did one for the Munsters. And I, the problem is, and, it's, and this is, again, the same kind of answer, I guess, that I gave before. But it, it's, it's a matter of if I know that if I do them enough and you keep getting them out there, eventually you would hope that more people are going to know your channel for that and the algorithm is going to start favoring your channel for reaction stuff. The problem is that unlike a lot of the other, th I mean, I edit everything here, but I don't edit those. Nerd Chronic edits those for me and he's really great at what he does and rightfully so, he's got a fee. Um, with what I'm doing right now and the budget that I have for myself and the way that I planned it out for the crew and all that stuff too, um, I it, it gets pricey. And if I get the, the the editor's fee and I pay the editor's fee, but yet the video only does 8,000 views and doesn't pay it back in AdSense, or it, it, it's just not worth it. It doesn't pay back in, in people finding it and subscribing or liking it. It's like, so it's it's harder to do. I'm, I'm really contemplating doing a first watch run of the Indiana Jones movies with Winston and see how those do. And if they, but like I said, like it's going to be a financial, not, not, I shouldn't say financial risk, but it's going to be, it, it, it could be a loss, right? Because I got to pay Winston. I got to pay Nerd Chronic for all th four of the movies to do. And then I got to cross my fingers and hope people want to watch it. If they do, then it's worth the investment to try to do some more, to try to do the first watch type stuff. But if not, then not so. Like, I'm glad I didn't do The Mandalorian. I was going to do Mandalorian, but the way that it played, like, I did Andor, and Andor didn't, didn't do very well either. So it's just not something that I think that I'm going to do as much. But maybe, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, next one here. Elliot Wilson, 2122. What would you rather, a Russo Brothers Star Wars movie or a Tony Gilroy Marvel series? Well, it's the same thing I was talking about before, right? Like using the sports analogy. I'm a Yankee fan, so I'm always going to pick. I'm always going to pick my 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 team first, and I want to see. Like I was bummed when I heard that the Russo brothers were talking about directing Kevin Feige's Wadlow's Star Wars movie that apparently never existed. Um, so I was I that I wanted. I really wanted to see that. I would. The Russo brothers are massive Star Wars fans. So I'd love to see them do a Star Wars. I'd also love to see a Tony Gilroy 
Marvel series, but I don't, I don't know. I, th- I think the thing is the reason why the the ironic thing about Star Wars right now is because it's not the thing that I love, that I wanted to have the most is this connectivity with Ed, the team. It's like Floney and Favre off doing their thing, Gilroy's off doing his thing, Leslie Hedlund's off doing her thing. Um, you know, you got the the Ray movie and the Floney movie. Everything's like all over the place. Um, the whereas in Marvel, it all kind of placed together with the team going okay go this way this way this way even though maybe the last phase hasn't felt like that um but i don't think gilroy would play in that mcu realm as well as he done star wars the star wars is like okay i know i i can connect to rogue one because i i pretty much directed the movie what what do you want me to do oh i want to do the spy thing and yeah, with Andor, let, let me just do my thing. It's not connected to anything else, and I'm not going to connect it to anything except Rogue One. And I think that just plays better for Gilroy. So I would pick the Russos. It's a great question. I love that question. I, I, the answer is I also wouldn't be upset if it was you don't get the Russo thing, but you get the Gilroy Marvel series, you know? Um, Ronan Unchained. Any chance that the big thing, Sith Council, Capes and Cows, would have a presence at Comic-Con? Um, unlikely, uh, but... That's not to say that I'm not going to be there. I'm. It looks like I'm going to go to do at least – I'm going to try to do Mark's comedy show if he still will have me. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on something that if it happens, which my fingers are crossed that it will, that we're aiming to try to do something at Comic-Con. And if we do, that will be big. And I guarantee you that everybody that I – mention it to here that's watching this will want to be there um but i don't know if it's going to happen so we have to just cross my fingers but i will be there regardless for those days um whether or not we're going to have i don't think we're going to we're not going to have a a presence and i think that one of the reasons why is because of strangely enough as i just mentioned with schmodem when the schmodem was at, at the heights of its live events and selling out all over the place the place we did the worst was San Diego Comic Con, and to be fair, the venue that we what we had at as great as the venue was, it was like twenty minutes away, fifteen twenty minutes away from Comic Con. So you really you had to drive pat you had to drive out of the gas lamp dis- district to to do it, and it, it definitely was it definitely hurt us. I mean we it was like a th- 400 seater and I think we got like 250 in there or something I remember this one guy and I said and they say he's a great fan so I'm at Star Wars Celebration I always remember him as the guy who went how come this place isn't packed and I'm like you gotta bring that up now I'm aware of it guy he, he was a sweetheart of a guy and he was a big fan he was there every freaking event he was always excited about it but it was like oh and it was and it was and it wasn't had, had the video itself crushed there it was Richard Cushing versus Mike Kalinowski for the IG title it was like it was a massive event, and like I had said, we just sold out New York. We wound up selling out Chicago. I think it was at a uh, we sold a, we sold that was the thousand seat a little while beforehand, but then we sold out Orlando like two months later. So it had nothing to do with it. Wasn't the the show at all? The show was Atlanta sold out, but it was for some reason the offset of of San Diego or of uh, Comic Con making people travel out. You got to do it right on the strip. And now everybody has um, everybody has those things booked, and it'd probably be just too pricey. So, but I'm hoping that the other thing happens. We'll see. All right, let's see what else. The Grouch seventy four. You've been fortunate to have interviewed a number of amazing celebrities throughout your career. Do you have a personal highlight? And is there anyone in particular you'd love to sit down and talk to for personal pleasure and not work related that you haven't managed to yet? Well, I met Julia Roberts. I met her, but I never interviewed her. Would love to have a one-on-one with her. For that would be great. That would be one for sure. As far as personal highlight, and Stallone, Harrison Ford, all those interviews. By the way, if you ever want to see any of the interviews that I've done, whether it's on this channel or from the past, and all the ones that I could find, there's a playlist on this channel that just says Christian Harloff interviews, and they're all up there from the times I did my show with Tiffany Smith to the Comic Con stuff of Fandango to Collider Live to all that stuff. Schmoes know they're all on there. So if you want to see any of those interviews, it's all in a playlist called um, Christian Harloff Interviews, and you can sift through it. There's, I mean, pleasantly, no, there's a, there's a ton of them. So 
Um, but yeah, personal highlight would be Stallone. Making Stallone laugh was awesome. Um, I mean, there's a lot of great ones. So that was those are those are some of them. Probably just to have like a full on one on one interview with, with Julia Roberts would be would be great. Um, and Don Mattingly would be another one too. All right, let's see. Save the cow. No, saved ca- saved a cows four seven one four. Maybe we talked about it on Sith, but I was wondering your thoughts on Star Wars Vision 2, or you will watch. Yeah, I've watched the whole thing, and I have talked about it. But this past Wednesday, we talked about it on Sith Council as well. And Steph raved about it, obviously. And I really, really dug it. Same story team working on that as, as Jedi Survivor on Lucasfilm. I think they should be doing more stuff for live action and other things. I think they're really good. I think they, they get Star Wars really well. Um, so, yeah, the, my biggest thing with, the, with Visions is that all of the stories worked for me. It's just not all the animated styles work for me, but that's a me preference more so. Like, I know people love the Wallace and Gromit thing. I just, for, for the Star Wars side of it, didn't work for me. The story worked, but that particular, it took me out of it. But that's not, that has nothing to do with anything. That's a, that's a me thing. Um, but yeah, I really liked Visions a lot, and we did talk about it. You should, if you want to see a full breakdown on it, check out Steph's um, gushing review of it from Sith Council this past week. Okay. This is a couple left. Damon Hawk 65 43 says, Hey, what happened to this Tony Soprano painting? You mean this one? It's right there. It's just it's just on the new it's on the new set. It's a different set. It's got uh it's by the couch and it just fits better there than right behind me because Brett was right. It's a, it's a, my my shot over here looks better now. It just there's more there's more going on. It's the set looks good and then you got this for when people and publicists come in, they sit down and they have this, and it's pre- it's pretty great. I'm excited for it. I like it. Um, I think that was the last one. I think that was it. So thank you guys for joining me here today, and thank you to Catherine McNamara for joining us on the show as well. Please make sure you comment and you hit like and you share the show and you let people know about it, and you check us out on Spotify and, and, and all that and more. It really helps out the show tremendously. Helps us get great sponsors like Mint Mobile and Carbon Health. And by the way, for Carbon Health, I wanted to let you guys know this. Just click on that link in the description. That helps. You browse around there too. Even if you don't necessarily, you don't, you can't purchase anything there. You go and you check it out and just look around that website. That helps us because they want to get more people aware of, of them. And if you check it out, just to look and say, what is this Carbon Health? thing all about that Christian talks about all the damn time. Click on it. Go around there because then they see and they go, oh, man. When when Christian and the, and the audience is talking about it, they, they go in there and they're, and they're figuring out, they're looking at it. It's funny. Like I even went to, I was in, where the hell was it? I want to tell you it's Sherman Oaks. I don't know if that's true. Probably not. But I was in, I was getting a, um, I was getting my tux for Riley's wedding and inside of the shopping center, right to the right of it, was a Carbon Health, and I said, "Hey, look at that, Carbon Health," and I'm sure you guys will will see that too. And you go, "Oh, Carbon Health!" So check it out. Click click on that link. That helps. I browse around. That helps us tremendously. Um, but that's it, guys. Once again, you're going to be in the East Coast, June 24th in Stamford, Connecticut. Get those tickets. And June 23rd, come see us in Manhattan. That's going to be a crazy show. And if you're able to be there anywhere near it, get the tickets now. Um, that's it, boys and girls. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And we'll see you on the flip side. This is the big thing. Peace out.